Coming up, for Mother's Day, we honor the women in our lives who've made a difference. Meet the women warriors of the American Indian Movement who are at Wounded Knee. And Marionette Pember visits St. Mary's Indian Boarding School to connect her mother's past to family and history. Plus, my mom. Meet author Virginia Driving Hawks Navy. Join us for those interviews plus headlines on the ICT newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Support for the ICT newscast with Aliyah Chavez comes from the Arizona PBS studios in Phoenix at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. Thank you for joining us. I'm Shirley Snavy, in for Aaliyah Chavez. An accused serial killer in Canada has admitted to killing four Indigenous women. Jeremy Skibicki has been charged with four counts of first-degree murder for the deaths of Rebecca Control, Morgan Harris, Mercedes Myron, and an unidentified female called Buffalo Woman. Skibicki is believed to have left the bodies of at least two of his known victims at Winnipeg's Prairie Green Landfill. Police stated that a search for the bodies may cost up to $100 million. The surprise development has prompted prosecutors in Winnipeg to agree to a judge-only trial. However, Skibicki's lawyers are seeking mental disorder, claiming he was not criminally responsible for the deaths. We turn now to Washington, D.C., where Indigenous leaders spent two days this week making their case for federal funding. Polly Denetclaw was there and has more. 140 tribal leaders from across the country testified before a House Appropriations Subcommittee about the funding priorities for their nations. Some stressed specific issues, such as the need for certain health care funding. I would say the biggest need right now would be behavioral health services um, because of COVID and um, the need for behavioral health has just gone up substantially and we are having such trouble retaining good counselors, uh, psychiatrists, and there's just burnout. Or wildfire fighting resources that grow more important as the wildfires grow ever more dangerous. In the more recent years, they've been catastrophic and they burned with the higher intensity. Um, especially because our reservation abets forest service lands and they have different uh, land management practices than we have. And so when the fires break out on the forest service land and come over to our land, we don't have enough firefighters to fight those fires. Some leaders brought up long-term issues internal to Native nations. I think as Indian people, it's really hard for us to advocate for ourselves what the real need is because we don't want to appear greedy. So we don't actually ask for what we really need. We're just asking to meet the minimum needs and we, we need to be like everybody else and go for the maximum. And other issues that are specific to Congress. Sherman Warren says she hopes members of Congress do their homework. I would like them to read the 2018 updated U.S. Commi Civil Rights Commission report called Broken Promises and really take that to heart and really start looking at funding our programs at a level. As I mentioned in there, the U.S. Prison Bureau Medical Services is funded much higher than Indian Health Service. And while we have received some increases, we're still not at the same level as U.S. prisons. That says something. I'm not sure what it says, but it says something. The subcommittee will make recommendations to the House Appropriations Committee, which will draft a bill for consideration by the full House. Polly Dantclaw, ICT News. In Rhode Island, Brown University has their first cohort of Native American Studies graduates. Five graduating seniors have received bachelor degrees in critical Native American and Indigenous studies, a first for Brown. The new concentration took years to develop by Brown faculty, staff, and students. It was approved by the College Curriculum Council in 2022. According to Brown officials, the program 
opens doors for engagement with Indigenous communities and individuals. The Biden administration plans to ease restrictions on marijuana, and the move could have broad implications for cannabis research and business, as well as tribes. The plan would reclassify marijuana from a dangerous drug and recognize its medicinal properties. Such rule changes require tribal consultation, and the Indigenous Cannabis Industry Association is gearing up to press its concerns. Current law impedes investment for business, and marijuana convictions can be impediments for individuals. With the consultations ahead, we want to make sure that not only are tribes' voices organized to protect tribal sovereignty, but that we also have our rights to health care, housing, and transportation all aligned within the other agencies that will be impacted by cannabis legalization. The National Park Service is granting $23 million to tribal historic preservation offices across the country. Grants from the Historic Preservation Fund will be used to help tribal tribes preserve significant historic and cultural places in their communities. In the past, tribes have used the funds to invest in local stewardship of treasured resources, provide educational programming, and fund oral history projects, among other things. The 1973 occupation of Wounded Knee made household names of men like Carter Camp, Dennis May Banks, and Russell Means. But women also played powerful roles in the occupation. They were honored at the 50th anniversary commemorations of this historic event for the American Indian Movement. Stuart Huntington and I were there. The Warrior Women Project celebrated the women who put their lives on the line in 1973 at Wounded Knee. The project gathers oral histories from the women of the Red Power Movement. Some of the veterans of the occupation were in Porcupine to share their stories. Lavida Yigo talked about the spiritual awakening she underwent when she joined AIM. I was not taught my Kiowa traditional ways. I didn't under know. I didn't know. I didn't know anything about my Kiowa ways, but it taught me when I went to Wudani of uh, the spirituality of what it was all what it was all about. Well, AIM was all about, and I wanted that. I was hungry for something for that, and I found it through the American Indian Movement. I found my spirituality. About 200 people came to Porcupine like Diane Bird, who left her teaching job in California to join the occupation. She returned to Pine Ridge for the 50th anniversary commemoration. I was part of security working with these guys and they set up a radio and there was um, little radios in every bunker and we kept in touch with each other and they would ask and it was controlled. Um, there was a head of security and the security would know where the people in the bunkers were and what level of fire to respond to, whether it was 100%, 50% or hold your fire period. Because we didn't have that many guns and we didn't have that many bullets for those guns. We were surrounded by federal marshals, by FBI, with tanks, with all the latest weapons, like even from the army. And we didn't know it, and, but we learned about that later. And all we had were like little rabbit plunkers, that kind of thing. Madonna Thunderhawk has participated in every major red power operation from Alcatraz to Standing Rock. She says it's no surprise to find women at the forefront. And when the red power movement came, you know, in those days, it was, it, your community was the ones that made those decisions and decided how things were going to run. So it was automatically a matriarchal system. Still is today. But we don't have to constantly make a big issue of it and run around and, you know, because it's culture, it's tradition. It's the way it is. Tradition, yes, but the women of Wounded Knee still inspire. Their actions in coming together and reclaiming their rights as Lakota warriors, Lakota matriarchs, they, rec they did that for us. They made an everlasting imprint on generations and generations, bringing back the strength and bringing back the ability for us as, you know, Lakota people to 
be able to be proud of who we are. Definitely found the women speaking today to be so inspiring. Uh, about a year ago, there was a, a screening, uh, a film screening at the Fargo Theater, and so I was able to sit down with Madonna and her, her team and her daughter, and, and so it was a very rich moment to be in, in the presence of uh, giants. <laughs> that have paved the way for us. But yes, definitely find inspiration for them, from them and hope to continue pushing the work towards justice forward for all of us. Pushing forward with a powerful message. I'm not only a survivor of Wudini, I'm a survivor of rape and abuse, domestic violence. I'm a survivor of those three. So I call myself, I used to be in a victim stage or think I was a victim. I'm no longer a victim. That's a good message. Yeah. And if you're in, if you're in that kind of trouble, get help. There's help out there. Get brave enough. Get courage in your heart to take a stand for yourself. That's what it's all about. And that's what AIM taught me. That was, that's what being in Wounded Knee taught me, was to be more bold, speak up. Creator didn't make you a mouth and not say nothing, speak up. St. Mary's Indian Boarding School is a place tied to history for ICT's national correspondent, Marionette Pember. The school once operated on the Bad River Ojibwe Reservation in Wisconsin, and it was the school her mother attended. Marionette shares this story. I recently traveled to the mother house of the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration the Order of Catholic Nuns who taught at St. Mary's Indian Boarding School on the Bad River Reservation in Wisconsin, where my mother attended school in the 30s and 1940s. Located in La Crosse, Wisconsin, the Order's sprawling buildings include a convent, living space and nursing home for sisters, office spaces, archives, museum, and chapel. All are connected by a series of underground tunnels. The sisters gave me a tour of their properties and magnificent chapel. This inlay is mother of pearl. Mother of pearl, and this is all marble. The altars are marble. Carrara marble from Italy. And you, you said you have no idea of the cost. We have no idea of the total cost of the chapel, which is quite a mystery. St. Mary's School closed in 1969. But like many Catholic orders that operated Indian boarding schools, the sisters have embarked on a campaign to examine this work and create a truth and healing process for harm they committed against indigenous peoples. The sisters are digitizing their boarding school archives and making them available to the Bad River tribe. So tell me a little bit about, you know, what the order is doing regarding its history um, at, uh, uh, at the St. Mary's Indian Boarding School in Odana on the Bad River Reservation, which I understand is the only Indian boarding school that uh, the sisters taught at. Is that correct? That's correct. We yeah. administered at it from we administered it from 1883 to 1969, and right now I would say we're in um, a big learning curve of, of what the history is. We're we're relooking at the history. Um, We've been doing a lot of a lot of webinars, a lot of uh, research around the issues. Within our own community, we've had some some really tough conversations. Um, we've had we've had um, several um, community wide conversations about what this means of our own understanding of ministry, what this means of our complicity in what we can recognize our federal and church doctrines and policies that were unjust. That were I like to say there has been a lot of conversating. One wonders how long has this got to go on? I mean, how many, you know, it, it sounds so vague and open-ended and it doesn't really sound like, you know, it, it's all this sort of internal stuff that's going on framed in this fearfulness mm -hmm. of not opening the, in, these institutions, not opening themselves up to possible perhaps financial risk, mm -hmm. you know. Um, 
that's really kind of what it seems to be to me, you know, as a, a person looking in. Um, so it doesn't seem to be moving very quickly. And that I think a lot of people find that really disappointing. You know, people who have been living their entire lives in this reality, um, their perspective is understandably different than people who are just saying after two years, wait a minute, wait, there's a problem here? <laughs> um, and, and you're right, I, it's been a long time in coming. Mary, this is particularly for you. This is personal because the story of your mother and your grandmother, as you've shared it with the world, you've also shared it with me. I've prayed about your mom. I've prayed about your grandma. I've prayed about you. And I want you to know that I have heard the pain. I can't comprehend it, but I've heard it. I believe it. And as the president of the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration, I am sorry. I apologize for what those experiences and what our school has done in your family. I am sorry. And know that I will continue to pray because I think that this conversation right now it's part of a bigger picture that neither one of us knows, you know, who's holding it. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Miigwech. Thank you. The sisters' apology and blessings were unexpected, but represent an important first start towards healing. True reconciliation, however, demands action from all Catholic Indian boarding school entities. That action includes opening all church archives to survivors and their families. Surely, after all this time, Native peoples and all Americans deserve to know the truth. Marionette Pember in La Crosse, Wisconsin for ICT. My mother is author Virginia Driving Hawks Navy, and she went to boarding school in South Dakota, St. Mary's Episcopal School for Indian Girls. I interviewed her last summer about her experiences there. My mother is an author of several books, fiction and nonfiction. In 1933, Virginia Driving Hawk was born on the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. We sat down this summer to talk about her youth. She attended boarding school during the World War II era. At St. Mary's, that was when during World War II, when we had teachers that were coming from, um, mainly from New England places. And um, we had this uh, Japanese teacher that came to be with us. And I didn't think much about her. I mean, she didn't look much differently <laughs> than the Indian students we had. And she was, uh, and I didn't have her for a class because I think she didn't taught uh, the advanced English classes, and I wasn't ready for that yet. But uh, we had an all-school assembly, and she was explaining about how she came to be at St. Mary's. Her family were in California, and she had gone to school in, in the East, and I don't remember the college where it was, but she had been sponsored uh, by um, an Episcopal congregation. And then uh, after her parents were injured, they were taken from their homes and placed in these camps in Nevada and uh, because they were worried about them being espionage and spies that close to Japan. The congregation in the East did not want her going back to those internment camps. So some pulled some strings some way or other and said that they would uh, be responsible for her. And so they managed to find her this teaching position in the interior of the United States where things would be all safe for her and no spies, that sort of thing. And I remember being so appalled about how can we treat people like that, just take them away from their homes and then move them to strange places, and she wouldn't be able to go home. And I expressed that to her. I said, oh, that's just terrible that you had to be treated like that. And she looked at me and she said, what do you think reservations are? And of course, I suppose I was about 12 years old and something like that never even occurred to me. 
what it was. And it kind of sparked my curiosity so that I became more aware of what my tribal life had been like and sparked my curiosity to explore that later as I got older and became a writer. Tell us about your education and how you grew up and, and where you went to school. I liked school very much. It was fun to be around other kids. And then we moved to Oak Creek, South Dakota, and I was in the third grade then and started school there. And I was very fortunate to have a teacher that uh, appreciated that I learned to read very quickly, and I loved to read. And he would give me books from his private library and everything, and I just assumed everybody had books like that. I didn't realize that. And then um, after the third grade, I stayed in Oak Creek until I was ready for the sixth grade. And then my parents decided I should go to boarding school. And this was usually what happened to children on the reservation. If they wanted more education, they had to go to a boarding school. Well, my parents decided that the Rosebud Boarding School, that's where they went. And they had some unfortunate experiences there in not being able to speak the language and other things. And uh, they didn't want, they didn't think I would get the education that I should have. So they sent me to St. Mary's School for Indian Girls, which is at Springfield, South Dakota. And I went there when I was in the sixth grade and stayed until I graduated from high school. And um, it was a school uh, that later became considered a prep school because we were being prepared for further education, whether it be college or to, to do something uh, in some sort of an occupation that would require further training. What was your experience like at boarding school? I was very homesick. The first, I don't know, seemed like forever. And, uh, and we slept in dormitories. I was used to having my own bed and sort of privacy. And um, but the one thing that was running water <laughs> and toilets, we didn't have to go outside like we did at home. So that was a plus. But I was very homesick and I was very lonely and shy. And, and uh, then the school had a system that they called Big Sisters. So an older student would be assigned to a newer, younger student and would help them and, you know, may, and get through the maze of what was expected of you and the chores you had to do and making your bed and and all of these different things, which did help because somebody was keeping an eye on you. So, and then uh, when the classes started, that was, that was fine because I really liked school, enjoyed that. When we're talking about all the abuse of boarding schools, how, how about your, your relatives? Did, did anybody? Well, my, my parents, that generation, are the ones that experience that kind of trauma or might have. Uh, my dad I did not speak English when he started school, and so they were forbidden to use the language when they, in the classroom, and, they, and it was a very difficult a way to start to learn. And um, he and a friend of his, uh, Noah Broken Leg, uh, would sneak out and go hide behind the barn so they could talk Lakota to each other and kind of explain to, to understand what was going on at the school. They never f experienced um, any physical abuse, um, but they saw friends of theirs that did who uh, were often supposedly got into trouble for some reason or other, and then they would be physically beaten that, but they never were they. My dad said, we were good boys. My mother, on the other hand, went there, but she did not speak Lakota fluently. It was not her first language because her family had English. And so she had the experience of uh, being teased by the other students as trying to be a white person because she wouldn't speak uh, Lakota. In your career, you became an educator. You know, we didn't have much choices. At least I didn't realize that at the time, if you wanted to go on to do something after high school, it was either being a teacher or a nurse. Well, I had no desire to be around sick people or whatever. And so it was that was all that was left for me to do was be a teacher. 
And I got to many years later after I found out that there were such things as women who were lawyers, I thought, you know, I could have been a lawyer. I like to read, not necessarily a tri lawyer, but something like that. And I always kind of regretted that I never had that opportunity to, to look at that. And I, not many of us did at that age, at least Indian girls. With my mother, Virginia Driving Hawks Navy, and the Black Hills, Shirley Snavy, ICT News. E -clave. Kaolelo no keola, e kaolelo no kamake. E kaolelo no keola, e kaolelo no kamake. Our words have the power to give life and death. E kaolelo no keola, e kaolelo no kamake. Our words have power. E na moku puni o havaine, e alama. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world and blessings to all mothers out there. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.